So welcome to our next installment in the AMSSM Sports Economics webinar series. My name is Sal Portugal. I'm a sports medicine physician at NYU Langone Health. I will be moderating this evening's session. Today's topic will be pro forma and value propositions. The session will review and discuss ways that sports medicine physicians can add value to their divisions, departments, and institutions, as well as outlining metrics for success. This is a unique presentation as it features speakers from both the departments of orthopedics and rehabilitation from within the same institution. Both departments employ primary care sports medicine physicians. We hope you find this presentation to be helpful. Upon graduation of residency and sports medicine fellowship, we are trained to be independent clinicians. However, we often not trained how to best partner with institutional administration. Often it's not until banging our heads or in some cases even burning bridges do we begin to learn our, from our experiences? Our hope is that this session provides you with the tools to best partner with your administration. Our speakers tonight are Mr. Eric Ships from the NYU Langone Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Ms. Yelena Shainova from the Rust Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at NYU Langone Health. Please feel free to enter any questions you may have into the chat. We will do our best to have your questions answered upon completion of the presentation. So Yelena, feel free to take it away. Hello, everybody. I'm Yelena C. Nova. I'm a Department of Ministry at Ross Creek Health, and I have an MBA in Healthcare Administration and a Bachelor's of Science in Health and Nutrition Sciences. I've been in my current role for a year, and prior to this, I was a Department Administrator for Surgery Department. And prior to that, I was a Research Administrator for 10 years helping physician scientists apply for research grants and manage and post the work. I have no disclosures. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to everyone, uh, especially about these topics. Uh, my name is Eric Ships. I have a Master's of Public Administration uh, in Healthcare Administration. I also have a BS in Biology. I'm the Department Administrator for Orthopedic Surgery. I've currently been in my role as a Department Administrator uh, in Orthopedic Surgery for three years. I have six years total in Orthopedic Administration. I spent nine years as a division administrator in gastroenterology and hepatology. Overall, I have 20 years uh, plus of healthcare experience. I have no disclosures either. So, you know, some of the things when we talk about success, we have to define success in order so we can achieve it. And people define success in many different ways. Some people look at success as uh, being well compensated for the work that they do. Others look at non-compensated uh, differentials, like a good work-life balance a supportive environment, a resource-rich environment. Some people want to be content experts with a national reputation, and that's how they define success. Uh, success is viewed as something that has upward mobility, your personal satisfaction in what you do, uh, or you have an ability to help others, which is why a lot of us go into medicine. To begin with. Now, value, after we've defined success, we have to identify and define value. And, you know, what brings value? Bring, you know, value is being a team player, someone who is uh, you know, willing to roll up their sleeves and, and do what's needed to get a job done. Be helpful and collegial if you have to go out to a uh, site that's far off in order to sort of you know, fill a role and uh, help the department you know, service and, and treat uh, more patients. Uh, value could be just being a busy clinician, someone who has a very busy practice. Uh, you know, value can be someone who is a willing you know, a willing teacher, someone who wants to work with medical students, residents, and fellows and help them train to be the best physicians they can be. You know, others bring value through research and clinical trials. And you know, value can also be defined as someone who's being organized, especially with the large administrative tests that physicians are required to keep up with along with their clinical responsibilities. Now, values is not always dollars and cents, uh, especially for a lot of the primary care sports medicine physicians, as well as a physiatrist, they're not a heavily procedurally based subspecialty. But your role is very important because you are the musculoskeletal quarterback for the team. You know, you are the gatekeeper. You are the person that, you know, develops relationships with patients, tries to do the um, non-surgical therapies first. And when they're not, when they're exhausted or they uh, need to be referred to a surgeon or another subspecialty, you're the one that sends them to those, those doctors. You're responsible for providing surgical referrals to your colleagues, other subspecialty referrals, whether that be cardiac, whether that be uh, gastroenterol you know, gastroenterology, um, endocrinology, or, or a host of others. You're, 
are responsible for sending those patients over to your colleagues. You also are, are responsible for physical therapy referrals and radiology referrals through MRIs, CTs, and X-rays. Um, and value is also you know, staffing the training rooms and developing those relationships with the community so that you can actually bring the patients in to see you um, and to see your colleagues. So in order to develop your strategic plan and to you know, identify your value and engage success, you need to set goals. Now, the first goal as any you know, new faculty member or any faculty member is to build your practice. Uh, that's very important. And you know, sometimes setting goals with numbers is important. And we think 25 patients a day is really a healthy number for a physician to see patients in a day. And that can allow you to really build, develop a, a robust clinical practice you know, with that minimum amount. You know, but you can't do that on day one, it takes time. And uh, you know, there are many different ways to sort of build your practice over the, over the first few years, and that's to offer to do grand rounds, to meet doctors in your community or other doctors in your practice, knocking on doors, uh, seeing if there's an outreach department in your practice or in your institution that can take you to all the different locations and meet you know, similar physicians or, or physicians that would probably refer to you so they can introduce to them, they can place a face with a name. Obviously, working with medical students, residents, and fellows are important. Medical students, residents, and fellows all graduate. They go into different subspecialties. But having their uh, experience with you, being positive, seeing how you treat your patients, uh, they're more likely to refer to you, you know, once they graduate. So you, know, you should never miss an opportunity to work with, with these people because they can come back and really be a, a large referring source for you. It's also important to try to do research. You know, doing research will help you grow academically. It will allow you to um, get promoted through the uh, academic ranks of associate professor and professor, It'll allow you to partner with uh, the industry and maybe help uh, develop some grants and fund your research infrastructure. It can also allow you to be a destination hospital or a content expert offering therapies that maybe your colleague may not have and will require patients to come to you and make you a destination hospital. Now, in, in an urban setting like in New York City or Florida or California, you know, competition is fierce. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's fierce also in, in uh, rural areas, uh, but you know, you may be, it may be easier to gain patients just because there aren't as many people around. I know in the New York City area, it's, you know, everyone's excellent. In order to be a doctor or a physician these days, you have to be excellent. So what degree of excellence? And what we have found is that patients obviously want high, you know, high qualified people treating them, but even more important is being you know, a good listener, someone who's attentive to their needs, someone who's caring, uh, someone who listens to their patients. And this is all reflected and, and managed through HCAP scores or Prisgany results and ensuring that you, you know, tell your patients to fill out, fill out the survey when they get it because it helps you continue to do what's good and help you to improve where you think uh, you know, maybe we could do better at it. But the whole point of this is getting more and more people to do it, have a more representative uh, review of how you're doing. And as you build your reputation, you know, the word of mouth referrals come in, in addition to all the referring providers at your local physician network. And like I said, all those residents, fellows, and medical students that you trained will also send their patients to you, as well as doing the different, uh, you know, Team doctors, you know, doing the sideline games at uh, you know, high school games, uh, developing your relationship with, this, with the athletes in your community will not only bring the athletes, but will bring their families, will bring their friends. And before you know it, you really start to build a name for yourself and start to get up to that 25, 30 patient a day uh, practice goal. Obviously, staying organized is really important, uh, especially with the administrative responsibility that's on physicians these days making sure that you use uh, software and technology to your advantage through smart phrases, uh, templates, dictation. You know, there's nothing worse than doing the work and not getting the credit for doing it. So staying up to date on your encounters to ensure that you're actually going to uh, get paid for the work that you're doing is important. Staying up to date with all of your messages and uh, in-basket messages or, or any other type of uh, internal messaging between the patient and the physician is really important. It can become onerous if you're not on top. And then obviously the other important thing to do, especially as primary care sports medicine physicians and uh, physiatrists is keeping track of the patients that you're referring for surgery or to other referring providers. This type of information is not always easy to tease out a large um, 
electronic medical records or it takes a long time to get. Having a list just with pen and paper of, you know, I referred 30 patients this month for surgery or 60 patients, you know, in the last six months for surgery is very powerful and something that you can use when you talk to your chair, or your division directors about, you know, trying to get more resources, which we'll talk about shortly. Next slide. So again, now that we want to, you know, we have our milestones, we want to implement our strategic plan and achieve these milestones. Uh, we have to start with building your practice. You know, we want to make sure that patients can schedule with you easily, not long wait times. You know, growing up, I remember the, the best doctors were the ones that you had to wait six or seven weeks for. I feel that's not the case any longer. Right now, people are scheduling through their phones or they have an issue. They want to go on an app, see what the next available is and get it treated uh, very quickly, if not the next day. So ensuring that you don't have long wait times is important. Uh, when possible, trying to have at least two or three rooms a day to see patients will help you build volume and increase your flow and efficiency. Sometimes you only have one room. Uh, you, know, you can do it, it's just harder. Having two or three allows you to like bounce back and forth between rooms if you send a patient for uh, an x-ray, go see another patient, while in a third room, someone's being moved in and uh, getting ready to be seen by maybe a medical assistant or someone else before you have a chance to go see them. Again, keeping records of who you refer to is important, making connections with the referring providers, supporting the local schools. Another thing that's more important now than it was probably 10 or 15 years ago is developing a social media presence. This is something that just builds upon itself. Having a Twitter account or an Instagram uh, page, even Facebook to some extent is important because if you see something that's interesting about what your specialty is, tweet about it and then someone else will pick it up Someone else will pick it up and before you know it, you have a large amount of followers and then you become a content expert in a specific area. And uh, the people will know you just because of the amount of time that your, your you know, social media presence has allowed you to be uh, reposted or retweeted. Also trying to get into podcasts or joining you know, Sirius XM uh, radio shows, again, it allows you to promote yourself through social media, which, which again, as we have seen, can take a life on of its own. You know, creating a clinical research program where you can showcase cutting edge therapies is really important. Uh, it's great because, you know, by working with medical students and residents and fellows, they can help you gather data, create registries. Hopefully you can partner with industry and get funding for some of that. So you can hire a research coordinator to help you uh, analyze this data so you can start writing manuscripts and hopefully that will translate into papers. And uh, that will allow you to bring in new and cutting edge technologies, like I mentioned, that may be, you know, the institution down the street doesn't have or people are looking for and they'll come specifically to see you because you have a specific type of technology that will help them uh, have a better quality of life. And all of this will help you build your reputation and your referral base. So, you know, all the things we discussed, that, that is your value add to the division, to the department, and the institution. Uh, you know, just because you're not a heavily procedurally based subspecialty does not mean you don't add value rule is, is critical, is essential to the functioning of the entire institution. And, and once you're able to sort of uh, implement those milestones and achieve those goals, then you can really ask for resources. You know, it's at that point, you can go to your chair or to your administrator and say, hey, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And I really think I need, a, I need another advanced practice provider or an RN to help me be more efficient to see more patients. Uh, they can see the follow-ups while I see the news. They can do the injections while I see the new visits, et cetera. Or maybe you wanted, you know, purchase a specific or specialized piece of equipment, ultrasound, uh, office-based procedure that you want. Uh, you know, that's another way to say I have this huge population, uh, you know, I think X amount, you know, I can, I can uh, treat with this type of a, of a piece of equipment. Again, and that's what Elena will go into next about articulating that into a pro forma showing the return on investment. Maybe you need additional office support because you're so busy and you're getting so many calls. You're doing so much paperwork, you need to have additional help in the office. You know, you've been successful growing your research portfolio. You need to have another coordinator because you want to do a different uh, type of a study. And people will seed you for that because they know you have a track record of success. And obviously, all this will help you with the academic promotion. The more you teach, the more research you do, the more publications. That will all help you build, build your, your stature in the institution and allow you to grow professionally and academically. And, you know... Obviously important too is being compensated fairly. If you can show the amount of surgeries that you're referring to, the amount of people that you're bringing in, feeding to the other subspecialties, you know, that can, and, and you have a busy and robust clinical practice, that is definitely support 
for you know requesting a higher salary from your chair. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elena, who's going to explain some of the fundamentals of how uh, you develop a pro forma and how you articulate uh, all the things that you're doing into a language that you know some of the other administrators of the, the budgetary gurus are going to understand in order to make sure that it's a good return on investment. Thank, Thank you. you, Eric. So what is a performer financial statement? A performer financial statement leverages assumptions about future values to project performance over a period that hasn't yet occurred. They also be, can be referred to as financial forecasts or financial projections. These projections can be used in guiding important business decisions and measure potential impact of business decisions. The three most common examples that we use for former financial statements for here in an academic medical center is when we consider hiring a new physician, when we consider purchasing a new piece of equipment or additional resources. So I'll go over those three examples in a little bit more detail. So when we're thinking about a piece of equipment, information that's important for us to get from you clinicians is what is the necessity? of this equipment. How will this piece of equipment help you provide better clinical care to your patients? What is the clinical application? What types of procedures, tests, scans are performed with this piece of equipment? That allows us to estimate the revenue that we can generate by doing these procedures or tests or scans. At some point, what we wanna show is what is that break even analysis? At what point can we cover the cost of this equipment and potentially generate revenue. So this information summarized in the financial performance statement can help us get approvals to purchase a piece of equipment. Other example is additional resources when it comes to staffing. We had a recent example where our providers had a long wait list and we were able to show that by hiring a nurse practitioner, to focus on follow-up visits will allow this provider to focus on new appointments. Hence, we can generate additional revenue and cover the cost and make profit. Other ways to look at efficiency in the office is perhaps hiring a medical assistant or an RN and thinking about ways you can delegate certain functions to sort of lower level, less costly uh, staffing. The other most common pro forma financial statement is a business plan. We prepare a business plan for every new hire, new additional position that we, we are hiring. And it includes two parts, the revenue piece and the expenses piece. In revenue, we think about what are those volume sources? Where are these patients coming from? Who are the referring specialties that that are referring to this new provider. Is this provider doing new procedures? What are those types of procedures? What are those CPT codes? How much will we generate from that? In rehab, where I'm a department administrator, we're able to offer hybrid roles, especially during the ramp up period while the physician is building their ambulatory practice. We're able to offer weekend call coverage, consult, inpatient rehab coverage, and physiatry services in subacute rehab centers. So the volume is then translated into collections. We always consider a ramp up period for a new provider. It is important to timely fill out all the credentialing paperwork to get yourself on the insurance companies as a participating provider that will help you get busy quicker. And other considerations that we think about in an academic medical center is this provided teaching, resident and fellows? Is there research involved? Are they playing a leadership role and administrative role in the system? And what is their value to the system? Again, what Eric alluded to you, what are other referrals that this provider will, will refer to? What are other subspecialties that this provider will refer to? On the expense side, what we show in this financial statement is the salary and fringe benefits, and that includes both the physician and any support staff, supplies and equipment, billing services, rent, malpractice, and usually it's higher for pain specialists, 
professional expenses. So this provider is traveling and presenting at a national conference is usually now the part when we, we cover those costs and overhead. So at this point, we'll open up for questions. Great, thank, thank you, Yelena. Thank you both. So while we're waiting for some questions, um, I, I think Eric, you did an excellent job of uh, highlighting uh, the importance of sweat equity, right? I think a lot of physicians don't don't don't, don't consider that, right? It's they've been in practice for a month, two months. Now they're thinking, oh, well, uh, maybe I we we just need a, a fluoro machine, we need an ultrasound machine, and we'll get more business, right? And you haven't even broken even yet, right? You haven't built up your practice. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. I think a lot of people uh, don't take that into consideration when they when they start out of practice. Uh, I, I agree completely. And you know, Dr. Portugal, the other thing that I want to bring up too is, and I, and Yelena, I want to speak for you, and you feel free to jump in if I say something wrong. But I know we we came from a similar school, Yelena and I, and um, you know, we believe we view ourselves as really the physician advocate and the physician partner, and our job is to sort of you know, advise you on how you can be the most successful and to provide you the tools that you need to be successful. And, you know, the, the sweat equity is so key, like Dr. Portugal mentions, because once you show that and you show the growth, you know, people will give you the resources that you need to be successful because they know you're a good investor. So, you know, investing that time early on, especially when you're first starting out to build your practice up and being open-minded seeing everything that comes in and not being too narrow-minded with what you're going to treat because that's you only want to look at one specific niche in your field is not the way to, the best way to start it's really to be open and then eventually once you build up and get really busy then you can start paring down or narrowing your focus onto what you really love to practice i agree yes. in fact you know i'll just add to what eric said eric and i both help out chairs when it comes to physician recruitment especially when it comes to folks just graduating from fellowship, just starting out building their practice. Some of the things I look for when I interview physicians is, do they have this flexibility, this mindset? Um, will they take department needs into consideration when they're building their practice as they're building their practice? Excellent. So it looks like we have a couple questions. And I imagine the answer to the first question will likely vary depending on the practice type. Uh, question is, on average, how long does it usually take for a new primary care sports medicine, sports medicine fellow graduate to break even for the institution? So a brand new hire, straight out of training, how long does it take for them to break even? In my experience, it's, um, it, could take, it could take three years to get really busy. And, and even then, you know, in our institution, you know, we have high overhead. There's, there's um, you get good reimbursements, but you know everything's expensive. Now, practice, you know, it's probably better, but you know, your secretary you're paying at a higher level because then compared to a regular office-based practice, fringe benefits are higher. There are other sort of taxes and billing fees, etc., that that come into play. That's where your value add is so important. Where it's it's important to show how you're, you know, funneling these patients in. You're not, you know, you're not just forwarding them over to the surgeon, you're actually developing the relationship, trying to treat them through injections or through not or through PT, non-surgical therapies first, keeping the physician, the surgeon's schedule open, and then when they're ready, you're sending it to them. And I know the surgeon appreciates that too, because they want to see the patient that's really surgical in nature and not so much that can be treated non-surgically. But I would give yourself really three years in order to, to sort of like at least at least come close to breaking even. Okay. And, and again, I think this, the answer to this question will be also dependent on institution. Also, uh, uh, something I think Yelena kind of hinted to is in terms of mission statement for the department, mission statement for the institution. Uh, so what recommendation advice do you have for physicians in rigid practices institutions that prevent them from being more efficient? So it sounds like, uh, I think it happens to many physicians like, oh, all I need is this. And uh, I think this would make me much more efficient. So um, what advice would you give? I would advise really partnering with your administrator. 
educating your administrator about the practice, about the potential impact it can need if you have additional resources, tracking information, and coming back and showing that information to the administrator. I will tell you even, you know, for Eric and I, it is not always easy to get these business plans approved. The system looks at many different proposals, um, but sort of sometimes you have to shelf it and come back to it when the timing is right. So continue to educate your administrator, partner with them, track information, and don't give up. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. Uh, you know. Some, some people are rigid, some institutions could be rigid. Most people are reasonable, at least I know at NYU, uh, our you know, chairs and, and our faculty who practice is reasonable, especially if you have a solid business justification. If you're just starting out, you know, that's where that team player and being collegial is really important, doing what you need to do, saying yes and thank you, I'll see that patient, no problem, squeeze them in. You know, that, that develops a good rapport, a good reputation and people are more it just kind of highlights the point that uh, um, I think most physician contracts, when they look at their contract, the incentive is based on RVUs. Um, I think most physicians work the RVU contracts and they, they feel as though, well, uh, I'm hired to produce RVUs, so I have a solution, I'm presenting a solution to produce more RVUs. But uh, as you're, you're mentioning there, Eric, is the, there there's more to it, right? The, it's... Um, in terms of overall value to the institution. It's just not RVUs and trying to produce, be more efficient in producing RVUs. Um, uh, that's part of the equation, but, but not all of it, right? And correct. And, you know, and look, it, it takes a year or two to get your, get your sea legs, like to really get yourself situated and to really start building a practice. And, um, you know, RVUs are important. And it's not, you know, especially in the beginning, it's not the only thing. It's really being the team player and trying to, meet people and, and build up your practice. That's your building period. Uh, and what I love to say, a great, a great line that I've heard, and I'm you know, cliche, but you know, if, you, if you chase quality, you'll always catch speed. If you, if you chase speed, you'll never catch quality. I think that's really important for a, a junior faculty member to understand that like, you know, you'll, you'll hit your stride and you'll hit your rhythm. Just, just be patient and do, you know, do it right the first time and, and make sure that you don't turn people away. And I can speak uh, from experience and, and partnering with Yelena. I think that that is at least uh, it's been our experience, I think, um, and that it's so important. Sometimes I bring up uh, a perspective that you're not considering. And, and likewise, it's I, I, oh, I didn't realize that the department was looking at that particular problem in that type of way. So obviously the solution should be different. Um, so we all have a blind side, uh, oftentimes, multiple. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I think opening that communication, being per, not aggressive, but persistent, uh, has uh, definitely has uh, is great advice. So moving on to the next question, how would you recommend initially approaching a company recruiter CFO when wanting to join uh, who may not have a sports medicine position in it, or even uh, open a, a new practice? So so I guess that would be like a multi-specialty group that does not have a sports medicine position. You see that there's a great need in that, uh, in that area. You think you would really bring value to the practice. Uh, how would you uh, approach that conversation? It's a great question. Uh, you know, as a, as a primary care sports medicine physician, you're, you're, you're also a primary care doctor, correct? Um, so, I mean, you can start... In that regard, it's just see, I would think, you know, the, you know be a primary care uh, physician, uh, but it depends on who your subspecialties are. If you, if you have an orthopedic group there, your, your value is like automatic. It's, I'm going to see these patients that have a strain that, you know, back pain, right? That doesn't need, don't need to have a spine surgery, but they just need to have some physical therapy or they need a cortisone injection. I'll help with that. Uh, or maybe, you know, my hip is hurting me. I have a bursitis, but, uh, you know, it's not ready to be a, a total hip at this point. Let me try to treat them medically first. And then when they're ready, I'll send them over to you. So that's, that's an automatic win-win. And that's what a lot of other orthopedic musculoskeletal hospitals are doing where they have a large primary care sports medicine uh, you know, presence. But if not, and it's sort of, you know, you're not sure who's coming through, 
going going in and being a PCP and then you know doing the cortisone injections or doing the um, maybe the ultrasound guided biopsies or or, or ultrasound ultrasound guided injections or, or 10x procedures may be a way to go or EMGs. I'm not sure if you guys do those or not, but but you can start building it there and create your own path. You know, and create something that people didn't even realize they needed until you got there. Great advice. Next question, when creating a pro forma, how long of a period of time is considered adequate? That's a great question. So usually when we create pro forma, we kind of, depending on what it is, let's say hiring a new physician, we look at a three year period or a five year period at times, depending again on a, at what point will we break even, even and at what point will we generate revenue and showing what that revenue would look like over the years? So if you're joining a system that already has referring physicians and wait lists of patients lined up, then it might be a much shorter period of time. So it could be just two or three years of a business plan. If you're joining where you have to do a lot of outreach, and sort of prove your value to the system. That could be a five-year plan. Great, thank you. So the next question, um, what interesting modalities have you seen new grads bring in for revenue? What are some that haven't brought in revenue? So uh, what I'm, uh, I'm interpreting this is that um, perhaps uh, a sports medicine fellow is considering um, learning a new technique like um, 10X, how important is it for them to be trained in 10X or to do floral guided spine injections or acupuncture? Um, so there are different types of procedures that as a trainee, you think, oh, this is a, a great tool clinically, um, but may not be of at least seen as great value to the institution. So I, I can tell you, and you know, I'm cautious because I'm only in rehab medicine for one year. Um, but generally speaking, what I want to understand from a clinician is how are you helping your patient? So if this is a modality that helps patients, there are no other ways, effective ways to help that patient, then we're interested in it. That's sort of how I look at those situations. Yeah, no, and, I, and I agree. I mean, obviously, whatever we're doing needs to be indicated. Uh, you know, we don't do things that aren't indicated. And I don't think anyone uh, will do that. And, and, you know, we just start to do the 10x again here. Uh, I, I, would, I actually don't know how it will be. Hopefully, it will be a lucrative uh, you know, endeavor. But a lot, a lot of times also, even when you want to do those types of procedures, there, are, depending on your institution, how big it is, there are consumable agreements that you can sort of work out with um, with the uh, with the company, so that you're only paying for consumables and that the equipment is free if you hit a certain amount, uh, or you just pay for the you know, the rental of the equipment when you want to use it, and you can see how it is. And if it really turns out to be good, then then continue with it. And you can make the purchase of the, of the capital outlay. And capital cost is something that is this institution is greater than five thousand dollars and has a useful life of greater than one year. That has a whole other approval process and requires the uh, Performa and the really return on investment analysis. But injectables are great. I don't know, uh, Dr. Portugal, if you guys do biologics uh, in, in, you know, in, in, your, in your field, that's another uh, you know, good thing to offer, uh, but that's cash and people have to be able to pay for it. Shockwaves are another one that's, that's, that's good, I think, as well for, for certain types of injuries. Those are just a few that come to mind. You know, off the bat. I think just to add to that, the, the discussion there, I think a part of that is also going to be depending on the environment that you're working in. Um, so if the, if the uh, modality is not covered by insurance um, and your patient population is primarily reliant on insurance, then right, I, I think presenting um, the said modality as your primary uh, means of uh, generating revenue uh, may not be so much of value to that specific department or institution, right? Um, or, so I'm just kind of throwing that out there. 
that might be something to consider as opposed to, well, this is a, an institution that, um, uh, that I'm not saying NYU specifically, but uh, some institutions are more open to the idea of uh, procedures that are cash-based because they have a large percentage of patients that are willing to pay for those procedures. So something to consider, just throwing that out there. Um, so moving on to the next question. Oh man, the very long question after the next one. Okay, so how do you emphasize the importance of academics in a traditionally non-academic health institution to help provide resources and invest in primary care sports medicine in a very competitive orthopedic community? So I, um, I guess the, uh, so it would be a, a, an example um, would be a multi-specialty group um, that does not have a large GME presence. However, um, you're very interested in teaching, perhaps uh, research, um, and the primary mission of the, uh, of the institution is not that of uh, not geared towards academics. Is there a way to even approach that conversation or, they, or is that not the job for you? Um, I can maybe think of one example. So for example, if there are patients, again, that you're thinking you can't find a way to help them, but there's a clinical trial that could be effective and you could be an enrolling site. So, right, so in an, enroll, in an industry sponsored clinical trial, for example, can pay your site for the work you're doing. So, that's one example. It can bring that to the organization to see if they would consider it. Yeah, you know, my, my suggestion there is, is you know, for, for all of us, right, we're paid for to be clinicians. You know, most of 90% 90, 90 of us are probably paid to be clinicians. That's why we're. We're hired into different practices or different institutions to see and treat patients. And, and you know, the clinical dollar, the clinical RVU will outweigh education RVU or education dollar or administrative dollar any day of the week. Uh, you know, does that make it less important? It does not. It's very important as well. It just, it's just the reality of, you know, hospital medicine, clinical medicine now. Um, with, with that being said, you know, my chairman is probably one of the best or is the best orthopedic chairman, I think, in the last 50 years. He's a phenomenal person, great, great reputation, and cares very deeply for his faculty and wants to make sure they have the tools they need to be successful. And he says it time and time again, you know, first job is, cl is clinical, but, you know, that's why we have nights and weekends to do a lot of the academic and the, and the research tests so it doesn't interfere with our um, responsibilities to treating the patients. You know, ways to sort of uh, help promote academic missions and maybe a non-traditionally based academic practice is, is A, participating in societies like this, having um, you know, meetings maybe regionally with other primary care sports medicine physicians and having you know, local chapters so you can discuss academic endeavors that, that affect your subspecialty. Uh, that will help raise academic uh, prowess. That will also allow you to know what clinical trials are happening and maybe you want to be a site for a certain clinical trial so you don't have to take on all the responsibility. You know, uh, doing CME events and maybe hosting a CME event so that people know who you are and you get, you get your name out there and you have an, you know, an educational component to what you're doing. Or even, you know, trying to, at different society meetings, talk to sponsors and see if there's a registry that they will help sponsor to seed you and seed your, uh, you know, clinical research infrastructure. So you don't even have to ask your practice for additional funds because they'll be paid. And then, then you can you know, look at the data, submit the manuscripts and, and, and write some papers and even do a poster presentation or a podium presentation from it. Those are just some thoughts. One other thing I'll just add, if there's a way to show that you can better the reputation of the organization by getting involved in research and education, where in your area, more patients will be referred to you, that could also be something to consider. And, and just the last thing to say also, Dr. Portugal is, and, and, for the, and for the group is, if you're in a hospital 
And if you have privileges at hospitals, you have to have an academic appointment. You have to have a faculty appointment at some institution at some university or medical school. You know, we are very big on including all of our, you know, we call them clinical faculty, faculty the non-employed faculty, to participate in, in, you know, fellow education, resident education, and participate in clinical trials or grand rounds. So there's always an opportunity to participate in an educational or academic component of a, you know, an academic medical center. You just need to make sure that you pursue it and talk to the right people to get on the mailing list to get involved. Great advice. And I'm just thinking, um, uh, uh, I'm just thinking about the question. I'm not sure if I'm approaching, uh, if it's addressing your specific question. However, I'm sure there are some people on the call or perhaps uh, who will be viewing this later in terms of remaining academic. If you're in a institution or a, a practice that's not so academic, however, uh, you would like to you know, continue to remain in academia, uh, I, I love the uh, recommendation to be involved in AMSSM, right? Uh, volunteer your time uh, on the committees, um, contribute to the chapters. That's um, so uh, in your state societies, right? So uh, there, there are multiple ways of doing that if you're in a different type of work environment, but you can still be remain very involved in academia uh, through your uh, national and, and regional societies. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, great talk, much needed as I am a recent uh, graduate. I started in a very busy ortho group with over 250 referral base and I'm a, I am the first sports medicine physician. The ro role was created uh, with the support from the surgeons as they see the need. My expectation was that I'd be playing the quarterback role in offloading their schedules. However, I'm finding out this is not necessarily the case. How do you or how do I approach this topic with the surgeons and them not seeing me as I'm stealing their patients? Is this, the more, of, is this more of a PCP education thing to get referrals sent to me instead of surgeons? as most have 30 to 40 day wait period. So that's a great question, right? So in some scenarios, there may not be, um, uh, the, the demand may be in such a way that the orthopedic surgeons can't keep up with the surgeries uh, or the surgeons are not interested in non-operative management and are really primarily focused or interested in um, arthroscopy, right? So depending on the environment, you might be in a situation where you have many sports medicine orthopedic surgeons that are interested in non-operative uh, sports medicine care, right? So, uh, yeah. So, how do we, how do you suggest that a, a primary care sports medicine doc uh, approach this? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hot button topic. It's very, it's very, it's very political. Um, you know, if you're the first primary care sports medicine surgeon in that practice. I am sure the orthopedic surgeons are used to dealing with all the patients on their own and giving it to their you know, PAs or MPs to sort of maybe do some of the non-surgical therapies like injections or et cetera. So it's gonna take some time to change the culture. You, know, you have to have patients. Uh, I, I do know I, sometimes a surgeon's mentality is, is uh, strong and really you know, talking to them and, and almost asking them, how, how can I better serve you? How can our relationship be better where I can help you and you can help me? I love to refer surgeons, surgeries to you. Um, you know, I can do X, Y, and Z to sort of offload your schedule so you can see more surgical candidates. Um, what are your thoughts about this? You know, he may say, I think it's a horrible idea. I don't want to see all patients myself. <laughs> At which point we have to come up with a plan B, but you know, seeing your patient, those patients and trying to get them in they're referring them, it will be a relationship that is built over time once trust is established. And it, it's not going to be an easy road, but hopefully with the support of the senior surgeons in the practice of the senior partners, they can lay out guidelines where everyone's happiness and applicable, mutual and beneficial relationship. I think that's great advice. And I, and I and I do think that suggestion, I think that uh, uh, was made earlier regarding um, reaching out to the primary care 
I guess one is serving the role also as a primary care physician and then uh, expanding your practice and moving in more the direction of sports medicine and or uh, your suggestion or question in the chat, I think has been something that I've seen many physicians do is educate the primary care physicians in your area of what you can offer your, their, their patients. And they say, oh, I see a, a ton of uh, knee osteoarthritis. I just didn't know where to, I didn't know that what you did or I didn't know that you uh, provided those types of services. So uh, I think that would be, uh, I think both avenues are, are good ways to approach it. So moving on to the next one, piggybacking off the clinical trials, would this be a way that we can overcome challenges of offering biologics such as PRP, et cetera, to a community that is heavy on Medicaid, uh, that is a heavy Medicaid population? Any other suggestions? So I think if you have a heavy Medicaid population, offering PRP as a biologic might not the answer, unfortunately, just because it is the cost involved. The biologics are not cheap by themselves and you have to have a markup in order to make it profitable. So if they can't afford it and, and you don't disclose that, you're gonna be out a lot of money. I don't know what the right solution is or the right answer is. You know, biologics are one way to handle it. Maybe a more conventional approach like a cortisone injection or some sort of you know, a covered therapy would be better to start. If it doesn't work, looking into surgical options or I don't know if there are any other types of infusions you can offer that are covered. Yeah, I think it's a creative idea. I'm just not sure that it's an ethical idea. So I would steer away from that. It, it is a, yeah, it's a tough one, uh, but a very important question, right? So. Uh, in terms of disparities of care, unfortunately, biologics is one of them. Um, I definitely think it's a conversation we need to continue to have. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a, an easy answer. So next question, I recently received an offer for the National Health Service Corps Scholarship. I'm debating uh, accepting the scholarship, but does not permit the sports medicine fellowship until after completion of the service requirement. To simplify the decision, I must make uh, must make. Could any of you with the ex with experience of National Health Service Corps uh, provide insight into which of these two situations would be best? One, complete the family medicine residency and then complete four years of service equaling $200,000 in loans forgiven, then apply for sports medicine fellowship, or two, decline the scholarship, pursue sports medicine uh, immediately after uh, family medicine residency. Um, let me just kind of, I'm not sure if uh, <laughs> Yelena and I, I we'll, we'll try our best to answer the question. Um, so and just, uh, I, I, Yelena and Eric, you may already understand this, but just, uh, just in case. Um, so uh, to become a sports medicine physician, you must complete a, a, a residency first, could be an emergency medicine, family medicine, PMNR, pediatrics, and then complete a one-year fellow sports medicine fellowship, right? So um, he's looking and it looks like there's certain criteria or, uh, restrictions regarding the scholarship. Um, I don't know if the two of you would like to, do you have any suggestions regarding that? I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I have enough knowledge to answer that question. Okay. Me neither, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I yeah, do want to say- sure. Go ahead. I just want to go back to that last PRP biologic injectable, uh, you know, usage in a heavy Medicaid population. You know, it, it doesn't even have to do with Medicaid. Commercial insurances don't cover PRPs and biologics. So, you know, unless you have a, a more affluent population, it's not a good idea to offer those types of therapies because it's, it's a significant out-of-pocket expense. So, you know, Medicaid usually don't have the extra mon money. If they do and they're aware of it and they can pay it, by all means, it's not covered by commercial insurance either. It's all cash, just to be clear. Um, so to that, the, the, the question, I do think that's, it's a great question um, that um, I do think that our, our sports economics subcommittee uh, should look into. Um, and we may even uh, perhaps build a, a whole webinar based on your question, um, but uh, yeah, to, to be continued. Um, 
I know that Yelena and, and Eric have to have to go uh, at 930 at the latest. We have a few more questions. Uh, we'll field them uh, until that time uh, comes upon us. So in relation to growing your practice, how do referrals work with primary care sports medicine? Traditionally, you cannot refer to a primary care physician as an assignment as a primary care physician. But if you're a specialist like a sports medicine physician, can you get referrals? Example being, if you want to start a concussion clinic, would you need to be in a specialty office or a primary care office, or is there a special designation? I'm not sure if I have the answer to that. Uh, now, with us, we have a division of primary care sports medicine. Patients get referred and they can book an appointment with that person. Hopefully that it's, it's, it's appropriate for them to be seen. That's more of the issue. Uh, it depends on their insurance plan and whether they need a referral or, or don't. But I wouldn't, for someone who has a, you know, we have special um, access center operators that scripts that sort of screen the patients. So someone who has a head cold doesn't see a, a primary care sports medicine physician or a physiatrist. Um, you're specifically uh, treating patients with sports related injuries. I hope that answered the question. And then, yeah, so, um, I mean, I'd be happy to look more into that question and feel free to email me. My, my email is first name, period, last name at nyulangone.org. We do have a concussion center. However, the primary care sports medicine physicians uh, that work within uh, the departments of rehabilitation as well as within the departments of orthopedics uh, don't serve that dual role of primary care physician as well as a sports medicine physician. However, uh, happy to look into it in terms of uh, how the concussion center handles it. Um, but uh, we'll, yeah, feel free to email me and, I, and I'll happy to look forward. Uh, you know, I try to find the answer to your question. To the previous question asked, find, you, find your niche in your clinic. Become the orthobiologics physician in your ortho practice. Be the ultrasound physician for issue injections and likewise locations so they don't have to send to another clinic. So it looks like it's a suggestion in terms of an answer to the prior question. Okay. And for those of us late to the party, will these slides be posted? Andy, do you have an answer to that question? I believe Andy said it will be available and tomorrow. So, I, so the video will definitely be available on YouTube tomorrow morning. Uh, in terms of the slides, uh, I'm not sure if they will be available at AMSSM, but you're free, feel free to email us. We can, we can send it to you, not a problem. Um, added thoughts to the above question about orthoclinic relationship. Could you, for example, be the concussion guy and bring in a lot of athletes that may at some point need surgery if there are injuries that would indicate it? Would that be a good way to add value? Oh, are there other ways, niche, uh, uh, niches that you could have, uh, that you have seen? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure both of you, Elena and Eric have seen uh, how uh, individual primary care sports medicine physicians have differentiated themselves from say the surgeons as well as amongst themselves. Uh, what have you uh, experienced and seen? So first, the example you gave is an excellent example, um, sort of starting off as a concussion uh, specialist and then uh, when appropriate, referring patients for surgeries. That's a great example of adding value uh, to the system. We at Rusk, I mean, I'm only here one year, but I'm really impressed of how busy our sports medicine and pain specialists are. Um, we continue to recruit, as I mentioned, uh, we continue to add on a nurse practitioners to help with the wait list. Um, and with, we just had a recent example where we hired a sports fellowship trained physiatrist who went to a multi-specialty practice 
and was the first physiatrist um, in that practice. That practice was primarily cardiopulmonary and didn't really see initially the need for sports fellowship trained physiatrists. However, because the physiatrists were so flexible in taking on other types of referrals, she is extremely busy right now. And with time, I'm sure we'll get specifically busy with sports-related injuries. You know, another, another good way to sort of create a niche in your market, I know we have the uh, Harkness Center for Dance. We actually have a lot of um, you know, primary care sports medicine physicians who are former professional dancers or figure skaters. Uh, and and they, love, they love doing it. They love to, to treat dancers who have dance-related injuries Pair mix is, is such as not it's not always the best commercial payers, but it's it's really a labor of love and it's a self fulfillment to sort of treat those athletes who are um, you know injured doing competitive dancing or or the like. So that's another way to sort of create a name for yourself and get your name out there as a specialist in, in the field of primary care sports medicine. Just to add to that, in terms of examples that I I personally have seen is. Um, there aren't a lot of sports medicine physicians, or there are, I mean, there are a lot, but uh, in terms of orthopedic sports medicine physicians uh, that are treating a pediatric, or they treat a pediatric population, but not, don't necessarily specialize in, uh, in treating a pediatric population, or say, are specialized in uh, treating the female athlete. Um, but I have seen that, uh, that uh, the way that individuals have um, shown their value other, other areas would be treating an area that others don't typically treat in, in your particular practice. For example, a lot of sports medicine docs don't treat low back, right? And so if you, if you have uh, comfort in treating low back, have an interest in treating low back, uh, I know that a lot of sports medicine physicians don't uh, have an interest in having a large percentage of their practice uh, be treating low back pain, which uh, is rare. Um, but that could be another way as well. If you perform a specific type of procedure that others aren't performing, uh, like EMG, like ultrasound guide injections, hydrodistension for adhesive capsulitis, um, hydro uh, dissection uh, of nerve entrapment. So that's another option. Um, just kind of throwing out a few of those examples. Uh, and I see within the chat, somebody has an answer to the question. Slides are unavailable via MSSM, but they will be available on the YouTube channel for viewing. So I think that wraps it up. Excellent. Thank you both for the uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, uh, audience, for uh, uh, asking and being very engaged in asking some very challenging questions. Um, made for a rich discussion. So thank you all. Great. Our pleasure. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening.